Kunjur sang our national anthem will re echo from shore to shore, and our flag of green, green in esteem and honor will remain aloft forevermore. Shinnegov in his show. Eight hundred years ago, the decline of Gaelic began when the English language crossed the Irish Sea. The English first invaded the coast of Ireland in 1170, a party of Anglo-Norman knights who settled in and around Wexford, and whose descendants spoke what one Elizabethan writer called the dregs of old ancient Chaucer English. In the beginning, the settlers became rapidly naturalized, Anglo-Norman names like Fitzgerald, Fitzwilliam, and Fitzmaurice became quintessentially Irish names, and some even adopted Irish Gaelic speech, to the disgust of other English visitors. Gradually, English became established on the big estates, but in the early days, these were English islands in a sea of Gaelic. Just 50 years after the landings in the south, the English took over the port of Dublin. It became the capital of what was called the English Pale. Beyond the Pale, as the saying went, were the unruly Gaelic-speaking Irish. The English consolidated this precarious foothold with a chain of castles. One of the finest is Trim Castle in County Meath. It marked the outer limit of the Pale and guarded a language, as well as a political frontier. Sean Dufresne has studied how the Irish mother tongue was confronted by the rise of English sovereignty. The Crown was always very conscious of the importance of language as a, a political tool and as a, an instrument of bringing about political unity. The Normans were described as becoming, in time, more Irish than the Irish themselves. Uh, this can be seen from the way in which they adopted the uh, Irish customs, they intermarried with the Irish, they adopted uh, Irish, uh, the Irish law system, they patronised Irish poetry, uh, Irish literature, uh, they uh, practised the Irish system of fosterage of their children, and most important of all, they became Irish speaking themselves. Some Anglo-Irish lords even adopted Irish fashion and went barefoot. The Crown always saw uh, a close connection between language and culture and ultimately uh, political allegiance in Ireland. One of the uh, authorities said, if the tongue be Irish, the heart must needs be Irish too. So they saw it as, as a, an essential uh, requirement that English be established if the Crown were to retain a secure hold on the country. Under Elizabeth I, the tempo of settlement quickened. By the end of her reign, Ireland was, for the first time, under effective English rule. But Gaelic still flourished under the English crown. This Irish-English phrasebook was written specially for Elizabeth. The English language was established at a price. 
The poet Spencer, who witnessed English atrocities, wrote that their Irish victims spake like ghosts crying out of their own graves. Military conquest was quickly followed by civilian settlements. English families were planted throughout the South, dispossessing the Irish, who became tenants. Another side of Irish resistance to Elizabeth is found here. This is Blarney Castle, home of the legendary stone. During the reign of Elizabeth I, the castle was held by the local chieftain, Cormac McCarthymore. Elizabeth, who doubted his loyalty, demanded that he surrender the castle. McCarthymore prevaricated for so long and so elaborately that in frustration Elizabeth is said to have exclaimed, Blarney, Blarney, I will hear no more of this Blarney. The stone itself is fancifully said to be the stone of Jacob's dream brought to Ireland by the prophet Jeremiah. Others say it was originally part of the Stone of Schoon on which English kings and queens are crowned. To this day, the Blarney means the gift of the gab, a way with words in a tricky situation. And if you kiss the stone, you're supposed to acquire the gift of eloquence. Can you help me? Yes, sir. Like this? Yes, sir. Just reach back now and grab your two pipes. Walk your hands down and kiss the bottom section there. Right. <laughs> Nearby Cork is the second city of Ireland and has flourished since the 16th century. Its speech is famously distinct from Dublin, retaining strong echoes of the Elizabethan settlement. Murphy's have been brewing traditional stout here in Cork since 1850. One man who's been working here for 34 years is master brewer Tommy Hosford. I was born in Cork, in the north side of the city. I lived in Cork all my life. I was in a mile radius of Murphy's Brewery. He speaks with a typical Cork accent, what many would call an Irish brogue. I think the Cork people speak with a very pronounced accent. His speech preserves characteristic pronunciations we know to be partly Elizabethan. Like William Shakespeare, Tommy says barely for barley. Murphy's stout is made up of malt, hops and roast barley. That's what gives it the black colour and such. That is something similar to Bruno Party Tea. Open up to me! As well as his Elizabethan pronunciations, Tommy's classic Irish rendering of thing as ting is a throwback to the native Gaelic. There are a lot of things to think of, and, you know, keep an eye in the bile, and you will get your dips up. Dips up, turn off pumps. Take off work pipe. And when the mark on the dip rod is reached by the liquor, that's the amount of actual liquor that makes the beer. The characteristics of the English spoken by Tommy Hosford and Rory O'Connor come from Irish Gaelic and Elizabethan English. These are the two main influences on what we call the Irish accent of English. 